Architecture for the Adoration of Beauty by Wallace Stevens Read for LibriVox.org by Winston Tharp 1. What manner of building shall we build for the adoration of beauty? Let us design this chastel de chastity du pensy. Never cease to deploy the structure, keep the laborers shouldering pliths, pass the whole of life earing the clink of the chisels of the stone cutters cutting the stones. 2. In this house, what manner of utterance shall there be? What heavenly dithyram and cantilene? What niggling forms of gargoyle patter? Of what shall the speech be in that splay of marble and of obedient pillars? 3. And how shall those come vested that come there? In their ugly reminders, or gaudy as tulips, as they climb the stairs to the group of flora coddling Hecuba, as they climb the flights to the closes overlooking whole seasons? 4. Let us build the building of light, push up the towers to the cocktops. These are the pointings of our edifice, which like a gorgeous palm shall tuff the commonplace. These are the window sill on which the quiet moonlight lies. 5. How shall we hew the sun, split it and make blocks to build a ruddy palace? How carve the violet moon to set in nicks? Let us fix portals east and west, abhorring green-blue north and blue-green south. Our chiefest dome a demoiselle of gold. Pierce the interior with pouring shafts in diverse chambers, pierce too with buttresses of coral air and purple timbers, various argentines, embossings of the sky. 6. And finally set guardians in the grounds, gray, gruesome grumblers, for no one proud nor stiff, no solemn one nor pale, no chafferer may come to sully the begonias, nor vex with holy or sublime ado the Kremlin of Kermis. 7. Only the lusty and the plenteous shall walk the bronze-filled plazas and the nutshell esplanades. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. Ballad of the Pink Parasol by Wallace Stevens Read for LibriVox.org by Winston Tharp I pray thee, where is the old-time wig, and where is the lofty hat? Where is the maid on the road in her gig, and where is the fireside cat? Never was sight more fair than that, outshining, outreaching them all, there in the night where lovers sat. But where is the pink parasol? Where in the park is the dark spadill with scent of lavender sweet that never was held in the mad quadrille? And where are the slippered feet? Ah, oh, we'd have given a pound to meet the card that wrought our fall, the card that none other of all could beat. But where is the pink parasol? Where is the roll of the old calash and the jog of the light sedan, whence Chloe's diamond brooch would flash and conquer poor peeping man? Answer me, where is the painted fan and the candles bright on the wall? Where is the coat of yellow and tan? But where is the pink parasol? Prince, these baubles are far away in the ruin of palace and hall, made dark by the shadow of yesterday. But where is the pink parasol? End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. Colloquy with a Polish Aunt by Wallace Stevens Read for LibriVox.org by Ruth Golding Elle savait toutes les légendes du paradis et tous les contes de la Pologne, revue des deux mondes. She How is it that my saints from Voragine, in their embroidered slippers, touch your spleen? He Old pantaloons, duenna of the spring she 
imagination is the will of things thus on the basis of the common drudge you dream of women swathed in indigo holding their books toward the nearer stars to read in secret burning secrecies end of poem this recording is in the public domain Sié portrait Madame Sainte Ursule et les Anges Mille Vierges by Wallace Stevens, read for LibriVox.org by Ruth Golding. Ursula in a garden found a bed of radishes. She kneeled upon the ground and gathered them with flowers around, blue, gold, pink, and green she dressed in red and gold brocade and in the grass an offering made of radishes and flowers she said my dear upon your altars i have placed the marguerite and coquelicot and roses frail as april snow but here she said where none can see i make an offering in the grass of radishes and flowers and then she wept for fear the lord would not accept the good lord in his garden sought new leaf and shadowy tinct and they were all his thought he heard her low accord half prayer and half ditty and he felt a subtle quiver that was not heavenly love or pity this is not writ in any book end of poem this recording is in the public domain the doctor of geneva by wallace stevens read for LibriVox.org by winston tharp the doctor of Geneva stamped the sand that lay impounding the Pacific swell, patted his stovepipe hat, and tugged his shawl. Lacustrine man had never been assailed by such long-rolling, opulent cataracts, unless Racine or Bossuet held the like. He did not quail. A man so used to plumb the multifarious heavens felt no awe before these visible, voluble delusions which yet found means to set his simmering mind spinning and hissing with oracular notations of the wild, the ruinous waste, until the steeples of his city clanked and sprang in an unburgerly apocalypse. The doctor used his handkerchief and sighed. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. Fablio of Florida by Wallace Stevens Read for LibriVox.org by Winston Tharp Bark of phosphor on the palmy beach Move outward into heaven, into the alabasters and night blues. Foam and cloud are one. Sultry moon monsters are dissolving. Fill your black hull with white moonlight. There will never be an end to this droning of the surf. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. A High-Toned Old Christian Woman by Wallace Stevens Read for LibriVox.org by Winston Tharp Poetry is the supreme fiction, madam. Take the moral law and make a knave of it, and from the knave build haunted heaven. Thus the conscience is converted into palms, like windy citherns hankering for hymns. We agree in principle, that's clear. But take the opposing law and make a peristyle, and from the peristyle project a mask beyond the planets. 
Thus our bodiness, unpurged by epitaph, indulged at last, is equally converted into palms, squiggling like saxophones. And palm for palm, madam, we are where we began. Allow, therefore, that in the planetary scene your disaffected flagellants, well stuffed, smacking their muzzy bellies in parade, proud of such novelties of the sublime, such tink and tank and tunk a tunk tunk, may, merely may, madam, whip from themselves a jovial hullabaloo among the spheres. This will make widows wince. But fictive things wink as they will, wink most when widows wince. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. O Muculus et la Belle Etoile by Wallace Stevens Read for LibriVox.org by Winston Tharp In the sea, Biscayne, there prinks the young emerald evening star, good light for drunkards, poets, widows, and ladies soon to be married. By this light the salty fishes arch in the sea like tree branches, going in many directions, up and down. This light conducts the thoughts of drunkards, the feelings of widows and trembling ladies, the movements of fishes. How pleasant an existence it is that this emerald charms philosophers, until they become thoughtlessly willing to bathe their hearts in later moonlight, knowing that they can bring back thought in the night that is still to be silent, reflecting this thing and that before they sleep. It is better that as scholars they should think hard in the dark cuffs of voluminous coats, and shave their heads and bodies. It might well be that their mistress is no gaunt, fugitive phantom. She might, after all, be a wanton, abundantly beautiful, eager, fecund, from whose being, by starlight, on sea-coast, the innermost good of their seeking might come in the simplest of speech. It is a good light, then, for those that know the ultimate Plato, tranquilizing with this jewel the torments of confusion. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. Inscription for a Monument by Wallace Stevens Read for LibriVox.org by Winston Tharp to the imagined lives evoked by music, Creatures of horns, flutes, drums, violins, bassoons, cymbals, Nude porters that glistened in Burma, defiling from sight, Island philosophers spent by long thought beside fountains, Big-bellied ogres curled up in the sunlight, Stuttering dreams, End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. Lettre d'un soldat, one to nine, by Wallace Stevens. Read for LibriVox.org by Ruth Golding. Combattre avec ses frères, à sa place, à son rang, avec des yeux dessillés sans espoir de la gloire et de profit et simplement parce que telle est la loi voilà le commandement que donne le dieu au guerrier arjuna quand celui-ci doute s'il doit se détourner de l'absolu pour le cauchemar humain de la bataille simplement qu'arjuna bonde son arc avec les autres Kshetriya. Préface d'André Chevrillon 1. Jamais la majesté de la nuit ne m'apporta autant de consolation qu'en cette accumulation d'épreuves. Vénus, étincelante, mais d'une amie. Le 27 septembre The spirit wakes in the night wind is naked what is it that hides in the night wind near by it 
is it once more the mysterious beauté like a woman inhibiting passion in solace the multiform beauty sinking in night wind quick to be gone yet never quite going she will leap back from the swift constellations as they enter the place of their western seclusion two ce qu'il faut c'est reconnaître l'amour et la beauté triomphante de toute violence le vingt octobre anecdotal reverie the streets contain a crowd of blind men tapping their way by inches this man to complain to the grocer of yesterday's cheese this man to visit a woman this man to take the air am i to pick my way through these crickets i that have a head in the bag slung over my shoulder i have secrets that prick like a heart full of pins permit me gentlemen i have killed the mare and am escaping from you get out of the way the blind men strike him down with their sticks. Three. Jusqu'à présent, j'ai possédé une sagesse de renoncement, mais maintenant, je veux une sagesse qui accepte tout, en s'orientant vers l'action future. Le 31 octobre morale and so france feels a menace that impends too long is like a bayonet that bends four si tu voyais la sécurité des petits animaux des bois souris mulots l'autre jour dans notre abri de feuillage Je suivais les évolutions de ces petites bêtes. Elles étaient jolies comme une estampe japonaise, avec l'intérieur de leurs oreilles rose comme un coquillage. Le 7 novembre, comme Dieu dispense de grâce. Here I keep thinking of the primitives, the sensitive and conscientious schemes of mountain pallors ebbing into air. And I remember sharp japonica, the driving rain, the willows in the rain, the birds that wait out rain in willow trees. Although life seems a goblin mummery, these images return and are increased as for a child in an oblivion even by mice these scamper and are still they cock small ears more glistening and pale than fragile volutes in a rose seashell five j'ai la ferme espérance mais surtout j'ai confiance en la justice éternelle Quelque surprise qu'elle cause à l'humaine idée que nous en avons. Le 26 novembre. The Surprises of the Superhuman. The Palais de Justice of Chambermaids tops the horizon with its colonnades. If it were lost in Übermenschlichkeit, perhaps our wretched state would soon come right for somehow the brave dicta of its kings make more awry our faulty human things six bien chère mère aimée pour ce qui est de ton cœur j'ai tellement confiance en ton courage qu'à l'heure actuelle cette certitude est mon grand réconfort je sais que ma mère a atteint à cette liberté d'âme qui permet de contempler le spectacle universel. 
le 7 décembre. There is another mother whom I love, O oh cher maman, another who in turn is mother to the two of us, and more, in whose hard service both of us endure our petty portion in the sacrifice. Not France, France also serves the invincible eye that from her helmet terrible and bright commands the armies, the relentless arm devising proud majestic issuance wait now have no rememberings of hope poor penury there will be voluble hymns come swelling when regardless of my end the mightier mother raises up her cry and little will or wish that day for tears seven la seule sanction pour moi est ma conscience il faut nous confier à une justice impersonnelle indépendante de tout facteur humain et à une destinée utile et harmonieuse malgré toute horreur de forme le quinze janvier negation hi the creator too is blind struggling toward his harmonious whole rejecting intermediate parts horrors and falsities and wrongs incapable master of all force too vague idealist overwhelmed by an afflatus that persists for this then we endure brief lives the evanescent symmetries from that meticulous potter's thumb Eight. Hier soir, rentrant dans ma grange, ivresse, rixe, cris, chants et hurlements, voilà la vie. Le 4 février. John Smith and his son John Smith, and his son son John, and a one, and a two, and a three, and a rum tum tum, and a lean John, and his son lean John, and his lean sons John, and a one, and a two, and a three, and a drum rum rum, and a rich john and his son rich john and his rich sons john and a one and a two and a three and a pom 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 and a wise john and his son wise john and his wise sons john and a one and a two and a three and a fee and a fee and a fee and a fee fo fum voila la vie la vie la vie and a rummy tummy tum and a rummy tummy tum nine la mort du soldat et près des choses naturelles le cinq mars life contracts and death is expected as in a season of autumn the soldier falls he does not become a three days personage imposing his separation calling for pomp death is absolute and without memorial as in a season of autumn when the wind stops when the wind stops and over the heavens the clouds go nevertheless in their direction end of poem this recording is in the public domain lulu morose by wallace stevens Read for LibriVox.org by Winston Tharp Is there a sharp edge? Is there a sharp edge on which to lean like a belly puckered by a spear? The cliffs are rough, are rough, and not all birds sing cock, sing coo, sing cock, cuckoo. Oh, Sal, the butcher's wife, ate clams and died amid uproarious dams. And Mother Nature, sick of silk, shot lightning at the kind cow's milk. And Father Nature, full of butter, made the maelstrom oceans mutter, stabbing at his teat like corns from an ottoman of thorns. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain.
The Man Whose Pharynx Was Bad by Wallace Stevens Read for LibriVox.org by Winston Tharp The time of year has grown indifferent. Mildew of summer and the deepening snow are both alike in the routine I know. I am too dumbly in my being pent. The wind attendant on the solstices blows on the shutters of the metropoles, stirring no poet in his sleep, and tolls the grand ideas of the villages. The malady of the quotidian. Perhaps, if summer ever came to rest and lengthened, deepened, comforted, caressed through days like oceans and obsidian, horizons full of night's midsummer blaze, perhaps if winter once could penetrate through all its purples to the final slate, persisting bleakly in an icy haze, one might in turn become less diffident. Out of such mildew plucking neater mold and spouting new orations of the cold, one might one might but time will not relent and a poem this recording is in the public domain metaphors of a magnifico by wallace stevens Read for LibriVox.org by Alan Davis Drake Twenty men crossing a bridge into a village are twenty men crossing twenty bridges into twenty villages, or one man crossing a single bridge into a village. This is old song that will not declare itself. Twenty men crossing a bridge into a village are twenty men crossing a bridge into a village that will not declare itself yet is certain as meaning the boots of the men clump on the boards of the bridge the first white wall of the village rises through the fruit trees of what was it i was thinking so the meaning escapes the first white wall of the village the fruit trees End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. Moment of Light by Wallace Stevens. Translation of Instant de Clarté by Jean Leroy. Read for LibriVox.org by Ruth Golding. From Modern School, Volume 10, October 1918. Before me, I know more one smaller at the first and then one smaller still and more and more that are my son and then his sons they lie buried in dumb sleep or bury themselves in the future and for the time just one exists i just exists and i am time the whole of time I am the whole of light. My flesh alone for the moment lives. My heart alone gives. My eyes alone have sight. I am emblazoned. The others all are black. I am the whole of light. And those behind and those before are only routineers of rounding time. In back they lie perdue in the black. The breechless grime, just one exists and I am time, of an incalculable ether that burns and stings. My will alone commands me, I am time. Behind they pass the point of man, before they are not embryo, I only touch with prime, and that will last long length of time, think what you will. I am between two infinite states, on the midline dividing, between the infinite that waits and the long abiding, at the golden spot, 
where the midline swells and yields to a supple, quivering, deep inundation. What do we count? All is for us that live. Time, even time, and the day's strength, my fellows, you that live around me, are you not surprised to be supreme on the tense line in this expanse of dual circumstance? And are you not surprised to be the base, to know that without you the scale of lives on which the eternal poising turns would sink upon death's pity underplace? And are you not surprised to be the very poles? Let us make signals in the air and cry aloud. We must leave a wide noise tolling in the night, and in the deep of time set the wide wind rolling. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. Le Mon Oncle, de Mon Oncle by Wallace Stevens Read for LibriVox.org By Winston Tharp 1. Mother of heaven, Regina of the clouds, O scepter of the sun, crown of the moon, There is not nothing, no, no, never nothing, Like the clashed edges of two words that kill. And so I mocked her in magnificent measure, or was it that I mocked myself alone? I wish that I might be a thinking stone. The sea of spuming thought foists up again the radiant bubble that she was, and then a deep uppouring from some saltier well within me bursts its watery syllable. 2. A red bird flies across the golden floor. It is a red bird that seeks out his choir among the choirs of wind and wet and wing. A torrent will fall from him when he finds. Shall I uncrumple this much crumpled thing? I am a man of fortune greeting airs, for it has come that thus I greet the spring. These choirs of welcome choir for me farewell. No spring can follow past meridian. Yet you persist with anecdotal bliss to make believe a starry connaissance. 3. Is it for nothing, then, that old Chinese sat titivating by their mountain pools, or in the Yangtze studied out their beards? I shall not play the flat historic scale. You know how Utamaro's beauties sought the end of love in their all-speaking braids. You know the mountainous coiffures of Bath. Alas, have all the barbers lived in vain, that not one curl in nature has survived? Why, without pity on these studious ghosts, do you come dripping in your hair from sleep? 4. This luscious and impeccable fruit of life falls, it appears, of its own weight to earth. When you were Eve, its acrid juice was sweet, untasted, in its heavenly orchard air. An apple serves as well as any skull to be the book in which to read around, and is as excellent in that it is composed of what, like skulls, comes rotting back to ground. But it excels in this, that as the fruit of love, it is a book too mad to read before one merely reads to pass the time. 5. In the high west there burns a furious star. It is for fiery boys that star was set, and for sweet-smelling virgins close to them. The measure of the intensity of love is measure also of the verve of earth. For me, the firefly's quick electric stroke ticks tediously the time of one more year. And you? Remember how the crickets came out of their mother grass like little kin in the pale nights when your first imagery found inklings of your bond to all that dust. 6. If men at forty will be painting lakes, the ephemeral blues must merge for them in one, the basic slate, the universal hue. There is a substance in us that prevails. But in our amours, amorists discern such fluctuations that their scrivening is breathless to attend each quirky turn. 
When amorists grow bald, then amours shrink into the compass and curriculum of introspective exiles lecturing. It is a theme for Hyacinth alone. 7. The mules that angels ride come slowly down the blazing passes from beyond the sun. Dissensions of their tinkling bells arrive. These muleteers are dainty of their way. Meantime, centurions guffaw and beat their shrilling tankards on the table boards. This parable in sense amounts to this. The honey of heaven may or may not come, but that of earth both comes and goes at once. Suppose these couriers brought amid their train a damsel heightened by eternal bloom. 8. Like a dull scholar, I behold, in love, an ancient aspect touching a new mind. It comes, it blooms, it bears its fruit, and dies. This trivial trope reveals a way of truth. Our bloom is gone, we are the fruit thereof, two golden gourds distended on our vines. We hang like warty squashes streaked and rayed, into the autumn weather splashed with frost, distorted by hail, fatness turned grotesque. The laughing sky will see the two of us washed into rinds by rotting winter rains. 9. In verses wild with motion, full of din, loudened by cries, by clashes quick and sure, as the deadly thought of men accomplishing their curious fates in war, come, celebrate the faith of forty, ward of Cupido. Most venerable heart, the lustiest conceit is not too lusty for your broadening. I quiz all sounds, all thoughts, all everything for the music and manner of the paladins to make oblation fit. Where shall I find bravura adequate to this great hymn? 10. The fops of fancy and their poems leave memorabilia of the mystic spouts, spontaneously watering their gritty soils. I am a yeoman, as such fellows go. I know no magic trees, no balmy boughs, no silver, ruddy, gold vermilion fruits. But after all, I know a tree that bears a semblance to the thing I have in mind. It stands gigantic, with a certain tip to which all birds come sometime in their time. But when they go, that tip still tips the tree. 11. If sex were all, and every trembling hand could make us squeak like dolls the wished-for words. But note the unconscionable treachery of fate that makes us weep, laugh, grunt, and groan, and shout doleful heroics, pinching gestures forth from madness or delight, without regard to that first foremost law. Anguishing hour! Last night we sat beside a pool of pink, clippered with lilies, scudding the bright chromes, keen to the point of starlight, while a frog boomed from his very belly, odious chords. 12. A blue pigeon it is that circles the blue sky on sidelong wing around and round and round. A white pigeon it is that flutters to the ground, grown tired of flight. Like a dark rabbi, I observed when young the nature of mankind in lordly study. Every day I found man proved a gobbit in my mincing world. Like a rose rabbi, later, I pursued and still pursue the origin and course of love. But until now, I never knew that fluttering things have so distinct a shade. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. Nuances of a Theme by Williams by Wallace Stevens Read for LibriVox.org by Winston Tharp It's a strange courage you give me, ancient star. Shine alone in the sunrise, toward which you lend no part. 1. Shine alone, shine nakedly, shine like bronze that reflects neither my face nor any inner part of my being. Shine like fire that mirrors nothing. 2. 
Lend no part to any humanity that suffuses you in its own light. Be not chimera of morning, half man, half star. Be not an intelligence like a widow's bird or an old horse. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. Of Heaven Considered as a Tomb by Wallace Stevens Read for LibriVox.org by Winston Tharp What word of you interpreters of men Who in the tomb of heaven walk by night The darkened ghosts of our old comedy? Do they believe they range the gusty cold With lanterns borne aloft to light the way? Freemen of death? about and still about to find whatever it is they seek or does that burial pillared up each day as port and spiritus passage into nothingness foretell each night the one abysmal night when the host shall no more wander nor the light of the steadfast lanterns creep across the dark make you among the dark comedians halloo them in their topmost distances for answer from their icy Elysee. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. Of the Surface of Things by Wallace Stevens. Read for LibriVox.org by Winston Tharp. One. In my room the world is beyond my understanding, but when I walk I see that it consists of three or four hills and a cloud. 2. From my balcony I survey the yellow air, reading where I have written, The spring is like a bell undressing. 3. The gold tree is blue. The singer has pulled his cloak over his head. The moon is in the folds of the cloak. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. On the Manner of Addressing Clouds by Wallace Stevens. Read for LibriVox.org by Winston Tharp. Gloomy grammarians in golden gowns, Meekly you keep the mortal rendezvous, Eliciting the still-sustaining pomps of speech, Which are like music so profound, They seem an exaltation without sound. Funist philosophers and ponderers, Their evocations are the speech of clouds, So speech of your processionals returns in the casual evocations of your tread across the stale, mysterious seasons. These are the music of meet resignation, these the responsive, still-sustaining pomps for you to magnify, if in that drifting waste you are to be accompanied by more than mute, bare splendors of the sun and moon. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. The Ordinary Women by Wallace Stevens Read for LibriVox.org by Winston Tharp Then from their poverty they rose, from dry guitars, and to guitars they flitted through the palace walls. They flung monotony behind, turned from their want, and nonchalant they crowded the nocturnal halls. The lacquered loges huddled there, mumbled zazé and azé, azé, the moonlight fubbed the girandoles. And the cold dresses that they wore in the vapid haze of the window bays were tranquil as they leaned and looked from the window sills at the alphabets, at beta b and gamma g, to study the canting curly cues of heaven and of the heavenly script. And there they read of marriage bed, Tilio, and they read right long. The gaunt guitarists on the strings rumbled a day and a day, a day. The moonlight rose on the beachy floors. 
how explicit the coiffures became the diamond point the sapphire point the sequins of the civil fans insinuations of desire puissant speech alike in each cried quittance to the wickless halls then from their poverty they rose from dry guitars and to guitars they flitted through the palace walls end of poem this recording is in the public domain palace of the babies by Wallace Stevens. Read for LibriVox.org by Winston Tharp. The disbeliever walked the moonlit place outside of gates of hammered seraphim, observing the moon blotches on the walls. The yellow rocked across the still facades, or else sat spinning on the pinnacles, while he imagined humming sounds and sleep. The walker in the moonlight walked alone, and each black window of the building balked his loneliness and what was in his mind. If in a shimmering room the babies came, drawn close by dreams of fledgling wing, it was because night nursed them in its fold. Night nursed not him, in whose dark mind the clambering wings of birds of black revolved, making harsh torment of the solitude. The walker in the moonlight walked alone, and in his heart his disbelief lay cold. His broad-brimmed hat came close upon his eyes. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. Peter Parasol by Wallace Stevens Recorded for LibriVox.org by Ruth Golding au taureau dieu corne donne et sa beau dure aux chevaux why are not women fair all as andromache having each one most praiseable ears eyes soul skin hair good god that all beasts should have the tusks of the elephant or be beautiful as large ferocious tigers are it is not so with women i wish they were all fair and walked in fine clothes with parasols in the afternoon air end of poem this recording is in the public domain the plot against the giant by wallace stevens recorded for LibriVox.org by ruth golding first girl when this yokel comes maundering wetting his hacker i shall run before him diffusing the civilest odours out of geraniums and unsmelled flowers it will check him second girl i shall run before him arching cloths besprinkled with colours as small as fish eggs the threads will abash him third girl oh la le pauvre i shall run before him with a curious puffing he will bend his ear then i shall whisper heavenly labials in a world of gutturals it will undo him end of poem this recording is in the public domain Primordia by Wallace Stevens Read for LibriVox.org by Winston Tharp In the Northwest 1. All over Minnesota, cerise sopranos, walking in the snow, answer humming the male voice of the wind in the dry leaves of the lake hollows. For one, the syllables of the gulls and of the crows and of the bluebird meet in the name of Yalmar Lilygreen. There is his motion in the flowing of black water. Two, the child's hair is of the color of the hay in the haystack, around which the four black horses stand. There is the same color in the bellies of frogs, in clays, withered reeds, skins, wood, sunlight. 
three. The blunt ice flows down the Mississippi at night. In the morning, the clear river is full of reflections, beautiful alliterations of shadows and of things shadowed. Four. The horses gnaw the bark from the trees. The horses are hollow. The trunks of the trees are hollow. Why do the horses have eyes and ears? The trees do not. Why can the horses move about on the ground? The trees cannot. The horses weary themselves hunting for green grass. The trees stand still. The trees drink. The water runs away from the horses. La 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 de dum diddle dee de diddle dee da. Five. The birch trees draw up whiteness from the ground. In the swamps, bushes draw up dark red or yellow. O boatman, what are you drawing from the rain pointed water? O boatman, what are you drawing from the rain pointed water? Are you two boatmen different from each other? In the South. Six. Unctuous furrows. The plowman portrays in you the spring about him. Compilation of the effects of magenta blooming in the Judas tree, and of purple blooming in the eucalyptus. Map of yesterday's earth, and of tomorrow's heaven. 7. The lilacs wither in the Carolinas. Already the butterflies flutter above the cabins. Already the newborn children interpret love in the voices of mothers. Timeless mother, how is it that your aspic nipples for once vent honey? The pine tree sweetens my body. The white iris beautifies me. 8. The black mother of eleven children hangs her quilt under the pine trees. There is a connection between the colors, the shapes of the patches, and the eleven children. Frail princes of distant Monaco, that paragon of a parasol, discloses at least one baby in you. 9. The trade wind jingles the rings and the nets around the racks by the docks on Indian River. It is the same jingle of the water among the roots under the banks of the palmettos. It is the same jingle of the red bird breasting the orange trees out of the cedars. Yet there is no spring in Florida, neither in Boscage, Purdue, nor on the nunnery beaches. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. Quatrain, Go Not, Young Cloud, by Wallace Stevens. Read for LibriVox.org, by Winston Tharp. Go not, young cloud, too boldly through the sky to meet the morning light. Go not too boldly through that dome on high, for eastward lies the night. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. The Silver Plowboy by Wallace Stevens Read for LibriVox.org by Alan Davis Drake A black figure dances in a black field. It seizes a sheet from the ground from a bush as if spread there by some wash woman for the night it wraps the sheet around its body until the black figure is silver it dances down a furrow in the early light back of a crazy plow the green blades following how soon the silver fades in the dust how soon the black figure slips from the wrinkled sheet how softly the sheet falls to the ground end of poem this recording is in the public domain six significant landscapes by wallace stevens 
Read for LibriVox.org by Alan Davis Drake. One. An old man sits in the shadow of a pine tree, in China. He sees larkspur, blue and white, at the edge of the shadow, move in the wind. His beard moves in the wind. The pine tree moves in the wind. Thus water flows over weeds. Two. The night is of the color of a woman's arm. Night, the female, obscure, fragrant and supple, conceals herself. A pool shines like a bracelet shaken in a dance. 3. I measure myself against a tall tree. I find that I am much taller, for I reach right up to the sun with my eye, and I reach to the shore of the sea with my ear. Nevertheless, I dislike the way the ants crawl in and out of my shadow. 4. When my dream was near the moon, the white folds of its gown filled with yellow light. The soles of its feet grew red. Its hair filled with certain blue crystallizations from stars, not far off. 5. Not all of the knives of the lampposts, nor the chisels of the long streets, nor the mallets of the domes and high towers can carve what one star can carve shining through the grape leaves six rationalists wearing square hats think in square rooms looking at the floor looking at the ceiling they confine themselves to right-angled triangles. If they tried rhomboids, cones, waving lines, ellipses, as, for example, the ellipse of the half-moon, rationalists would wear sombreros. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. Song, Ah Yes, Beyond These Barren Walls, by Wallace Stevens. Read for LibriVox.org, by Winston Tharp. Ah yes, beyond these barren walls two hearts shall in a garden meet, and while the latest robin calls, her lips to his shall be made sweet. And out above these gloomy towers the full moon tenderly shall rise to cast its light upon the flowers and find him looking in her eyes. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. Song She Loves Me or Loves Me Not by Wallace Stevens. Read for LibriVox.org by Winston Tharp. She loves me or loves me not, what care I? The depth of the fields is just as sweet and sweet the sky. She loves me or she loves me not, is that to die? The green of the woods is just as fair and fair the sky. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. Sonnet Come, Said the World by Wallace Stevens Read for LibriVox.org by Winston Tharp Come, said the world, thy youth is not all play. Upon these hills vast palaces must rise, And over this green plain that calmly lies in peace 
a mighty city must have sway. These weak and murmuring reeds cannot gainsay the building of my wharves. This flood that flies unfathomed clear must bear my merchandise and sweep my burdens on their seaward way. No, cried my heart, this thing I cannot do. This is my home. This plain and water clear are my companions, faultless as the sky. I cannot, will not give them up to you. And if you come upon them, I shall fear. And if you steal them from me, I shall die. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. Sonnet, If We Are Leaves That Fall, by Wallace Stevens. Read for LibriVox.org, by Winston Tharp. If we are leaves that fall upon the ground, to lose our greenness in the quiet dust of forest depths, if we are flowers that must lie torn and creased upon a bitter mound, no touch of sweetness in our ruins found, if we are weeds whom no one wise can trust to live an hour before we feel the gust of death and by our side its last keen sound then let a tremor through our briefness run wrapping it in with mad sweet sorcery of love for in the fern i saw the sun take fire against the dew the lily white was soft and deep at morn the rosary streamed forth a wild perfume into the light. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. Sonnet I Strode Along My Beaches by Wallace Stevens. Read for LibriVox.org by Winston Tharp. I strode along my beaches like a sea, the sand before me stretching firm and fair. No inland darkness cast its shadow there, and my long step was gloriously free. The careless wind was happy company that hurried past and did not question where, yet as I moved I felt a deep despair and wonder of the thoughts that came to me. For to my face the deep wind brought the scent of flowers I could not see upon the strand, and in the sky a silent cloud was blent with dreams of my soul's stillness, and the sand that had been naught to me now trembled far in mystery beneath the evening star. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. Sonnet, Lo, Even As I Passed, by Wallace Stevens. Read for LibriVox.org, by Winston Tharp. Lo, even as I passed beside the booth of roses, and beheld them brightly twine to damask heights, taking them as a sign of my own self, still unconcerned with truth, even as I held up in hands uncouth and drained with joy the golden-bodied wine, deeming it half unworthy, half divine, from out the sweet-rimmed goblet of my youth. Even in that pure hour I heard the tone of grievous music stir in memory, telling me of the time already flown from my first youth. It sounded like the rise of distant echo from dead melody, soft as a song heard far in paradise. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. Sonnet, There Shines the Morning Star by Wallace Stevens Read for LibriVox.org by Winston Tharp there shines the morning star. Through the forlorn and silent spaces of cold heaven's height pours the bright radiance of his kingly light, swinging in reverie before the morn. The flush and fall of many tides have worn upon the coasts beneath him and their flight from sea to sea. 
yet ever on the night his clear and splendid visage is upborne. Like this he pondered on the world's first day, sweet Eden's flowers heavy with the dew. And so he led bold Jason on his way, sparkling forever in the galley's foam. And still he shone most perfect in the blue, all bright and lovely, on the hosts of Rome. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. Stars at Tallapoosa by Wallace Stevens Read for LibriVox.org by Winston Tharp The lines are straight and swift between the stars. The night is not the cradle that they cry, the criers undulating the deep oceaned phrase. The lines are much too dark and much too sharp. The mind herein attains simplicity. There is no moon, no single silvered leaf. The body is no body to be seen, but is an eye that studies its black lid. Let these be your delight, secretive hunter, wading the sea lines, moist and ever mingling, mounting the earth lines, long and lax, lethargic. These lines are swift and fall without diverging. The melon flower nor dew nor web of either is like to these, but in yourself is like a sheaf of brilliant arrows flying straight, flying and falling straightway for their pleasure, their pleasure that is all bright edged and cold, or if not arrows, then the nimblest motions, making recoveries of young nakedness and the lost vehemence the midnights hold. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. Street Songs by Wallace Stevens Read for LibriVox.org by Winston Tharp 1. The Pigeons Over the houses, and into the sky, and into the dazzling light, long hosts of fluttering pigeons fly out of the blackened night, over the houses, and into the sky, on glistening wings of white. Over the city, and into the blue, from ledge and tower and dome, they rise and turn and turn anew, and like fresh clouds they roam over the city, and into the blue, and into their airy home. 2. The beggar. Yet in this morn there is a darkest night, where no feet dance or sweet birds ever rise, where fancy is a thing that soothes and lies and leads on with mirages of light. I speak of her who sits within plain sight upon the steps of yon cathedral. Skies are not to her, and life a lord that buys and sells life, whether sad or dark or bright. The carvings and beauty of the throne where she is sitting she doth meanly use to win you and appeal. All rag and bone she asks with her dry withered hand a dreg of the world's riches. If she doth abuse the place, pass on. It is a place to beg. 3. Statuary the windy morn has set their feet to dancing, young Diane and Apollo on the curb. The pavement with their slender forms is glancing, no clatter doth their gaiety disturb. No eyes are ever blind enough to shun them, men wonder what their jubilance can be. No passer-by but turns to look upon them, then goes his way with all his fancy free. 4. The Minstrel the streets lead out into a mist of daisies and of daffodils, a world of green and amethyst, of seas and of uplifted hills. There bird songs are not lost in eaves, nor beaten down by cart and car, but drifting sweetly through the leaves, they die upon the fields afar. Nor is the wind a broken thing that faints within hot prison cells, but rises on a silver wing from out among the heather bells. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain.
Sunday Morning by Wallace Stevens Read for LibriVox.org by Winston Tharp 1. Complacencies of the Penois, and late coffee and oranges in a sunny chair, and the green freedom of a cockatoo upon a rug, mingle to dissipate the holy hush of ancient sacrifice. She dreams a little, and she feels the dark encroachment of that old catastrophe as a calm darkens among water-lights. The pungent oranges and bright green wings seem things in some procession of the dead, winding across wide water without sound. The day is like wide water without sound, stilled for the passing of her dreaming feet over the seas to silent Palestine, dominion of the blood and sepulchre. Two. She hears upon that water without sound a voice that cries, The tomb in Palestine is not the porch of spirits lingering, it is the grave of Jesus where he lay. We live in an old chaos of the sun, or old dependency of day and night, or island solitude, unsponsored, free, of that wide water inescapable. Deer walk upon our mountains, and the quail whistle about us their spontaneous cries. Sweet berries ripen in the wilderness, and in the isolation of the sky at evening, casual flocks of pigeons make ambiguous undulations as they sink downward to darkness on extended wings. 3. She says, I am content when wakened birds before they fly test the reality of misty fields by their sweet questionings. But when the birds are gone and their warm fields return no more, where then is paradise? There is not any haunt of prophecy, nor any old chimera of the grave, neither the golden underground, nor isle melodious where spirits get them home, nor visionary south nor cloudy palm remote on heaven's hill that has endured as April's green endures, or will endure like her remembrance of awakened birds, or her desire for June and evening, tipped by the consummation of the swallow's wings. 4. She says, But in contentment I still feel the need of some imperishable bliss. Death is the mother of beauty. Hence, from her alone shall come fulfillment to our dreams and our desires, although she strews the leaves of sure obliteration on our paths, the path sick sorrow took, the many paths where triumph rang its brassy phrase, or love whispered a little out of tenderness. She makes the willow shiver in the sun for maidens who were wont to sit and gaze upon the grass, relinquished to their feet. She causes boys to bring sweet-smelling pears and plums in ponderous piles, the maidens taste, and stray impassioned in the littering leaves. 5. Supple and turbulent, a ring of men shall chant in orgy on a summer morn their boisterous devotion to the sun, not as a god, but as a god might be, naked among them, like a savage source. Their chant shall be a chant of paradise, out of their blood, returning to the sky, and in their chant shall enter, voice by voice, the windy lake wherein their lord delights, the trees, like seraphim, and echoing hills that choir among themselves long afterward. They shall know well the heavenly fellowship of men that perish and of summer morn. And whence they came, and whither they shall go, the dew upon their feet shall manifest. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. Tea at the Palace of Hoon by Wallace Stevens Read for LibriVox.org by Winston Tharp Not less because in purple I descended the western day Through what you call the loneliest air, not less was I myself. What was the ointment sprinkled on my beard? What were the hymns that buzzed beside my ears? 
What was the sea whose tide swept through me there? Out of my mind the golden ointment rained, And my ears made the blowing hymns they heard. I was myself the compass of that sea. I was the world in which I walked, And what I saw or heard or felt came not but from myself. And there I found myself more truly and more strange. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. To the Morn by Wallace Stevens. Read for LibriVox.org by Winston Tharp. If this be night, Break softly, blessed day. Oh, let the silent throat of every bird Swell tenderly in song, As though he heard some brother Singing deep within thy ray. Send but an unseen breeze aloft, Away from darkness and dull earth, To be a word, a half-discovered sound, To make me gird myself And persevere this cheerless way. But softly, softly, Thou most blessed morn, Mine eyes too long accustomed to the dark May fail when thou in glorious heaven art born, May fail against that far entreated light, Catch but the glimmer of a distant lark, And drop, all blasted at the sovereign sight. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. To the One of Fictive Music by Wallace Stevens Read for LibriVox.org by Winston Tharp Sister and mother and diviner love, And of the sisterhood of the living dead most near, most clear, And of the clearest bloom, And of the fragrant mothers the most dear and queen, And of diviner love the day and flame and summer and sweet fire, no thread of cloudy silver sprinkles in your gown its venom of renown, And on your head no crown is simpler than the simple hair. Now of the music summoned by the birth that separates us from the wind and sea, Yet leaves them in us until earth becomes, by being so much of the things we are, Gross effigy and simulacrum, none gives motion to perfection more serene than yours out of our imperfections wrought most rare or ever of more kindred air in the laborious weaving that you wear for so retentive of themselves are men that music is intensest which proclaims the near the clear and vaunts the clearest bloom and of all vigils musing the obscure that apprehends the most which sees and names as in your name an image that is sure among the arrant spices of the sun o bough and bush and scented vine in whom we give ourselves our likest issuance yet not too like yet not so like to be too near too clear saving a little to endow our feigning with the strange unlike whence springs the difference that heavenly pity brings for this musician in your girdle fixed bear other perfumes on your pale head wear a band entwining set with fatal stones unreal give back to us what once you gave the imagination that we spurned and crave end of poem this recording is in the public domain. Vita Mea by Wallace Stevens Read for LibriVox.org by Winston Tharp With fear I trembled in the house of life, Hastening from door to door, from room to room, Seeking away from that impenetrable gloom Against whose walls my strength lay weak from strife all dark all dark and what sweet wind was rife with earth or sea or star or new sun's bloom lay sick and dead within the place of doom where i went raving like the winter's wife 
In vain, in vain, with bitter lips I cried, In vain, in vain, along the hallways died And sank in silences away. Oppressed, I wept. Lo, through those tears the window bars shone bright, Where faith and hope, like long-sought stars, First gleamed upon that prison of unrest. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. The Weeping Burger by Wallace Stevens Read for LibriVox.org by Winston Tharp It is with a strange malice that I distort the world. Ah, that ill humors should mask as white girls. And ah, that Scaramouche should have a black barouche. The sorry verities Yet in excess, continual, there is cure of sorrow. Permit that if as ghost I come upon the people burning in me still, I come as bell design of foppish line. And I, then, tortured for old speech, a white of wildly woven rings, I, weeping in a calcined heart, my hands such sharp imagined things. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. The Worms at Heaven's Gate by Wallace Stevens Read for LibriVox.org by Alan Davis Drake Out of the tomb we bring Badrubador within our bellies we her chariot here is an eye and here are one by one the lashes of that eye and its white lid here is the cheek on which that lid declined and finger after finger here the hand the genius of that cheek here are the lips the bundle of the body and the feet. Out of the tomb we bring Badrulbador. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain.